Be a part of WCTC's real-time talk. Like 1450 WCTC on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at 1450 WCTC. Jersey Central with Burt Barron. If we could listen to the radio. On the new talk radio 1450 WCTC. 808, hour number three of Jersey Central on a Telefriend Tuesday on the new talk radio 1450 WCTC, the voice of Central Jersey. It's Burt's. Good morning to you. Got another contest coming up a little bit later on here in this 8 o'clock hour, and it will have to do with a guest who will be joining me a little bit later on. I will give you all the details coming up. I promise you that. And we'll also do our need-to-know things coming up a little bit later on in this hour, too. You know, with all the things that were happening with Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma and whatever else is uh, churning out in the Atlantic for us, I don't think we're done with this hurricane season just yet. Uh, one of the big tasks, of course, comes to when it involves evacuating a hospital and taking care of people who are hospitalized over the course of these just horrific, horrific natural events that are happening. My guest on the Jersey Central Newsmaker Hotline knows exactly how this exactly works. So he was on the job at a hospital in New Orleans right as Katrina was striking, and he's here to kind of share some experiences and maybe his observations of what he's seen uh, with Texas and Florida in terms of evacuating some hospitals and what it will take to kind of get things back to normal. Uh, interim CEO and president of the St. Peter's Healthcare System is with us here today. Uh, Les Hirsch uh, back on, on WCTC. Good morning, Les. It's Bert Barron. How are you? Bert, I'm well. How are you today? Thanks I'm good, too. Me. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for making yourself available. I was watching what was going on with the evacuation uh, procedures and whatnot in Florida and Texas, and uh, it was brought to my attention that you are actually relatively new on a, a on the job at a, at a hospital or a medical facility in New Orleans and here comes this uh, this little storm, this little newsmaker storm called Katrina, and you were the guy who was kind of faced with uh, evacuation plans and executing an evacuation. Uh, can you walk us through with what that was like for you, Les, and what it involved and what was going through your mind this whole time? Yes, sure, Bert. Um, yeah, that was back in 2005. I became the CEO of, of a hospital called Turo Infirmary in New Orleans, actually a historic facility that started its operation before the Civil War, if you can believe that. That's how far back it goes, um, right in the Garden District in New Orleans. And um, I started there on the 22nd of August uh, 2005, and Katrina came in on August 29th. So I was seven days on the job, and um, the storm, you know, really crept up on us pretty quickly. And, um, you know, we didn't have any time to, to even think about evacuating the hospital in advance, let alone the infrastructure wasn't in place to make that happen. So, uh, you know, we hunkered down and, you know, the storm came. And, and as I say, it came pretty quickly because what was odd about Katrina is that it went across, it was in the Atlantic, and then it went across Florida uh, around uh, Aventura Beach and then plopped itself in the, in the Gulf. And then it just picked up steam really quickly. And within 72 hours, it was it was striking New Orleans and, and really a direct hit on Mississippi. The, the biggest impact for New Orleans, besides all the damage of a Category 3 storm, when it hit was all of the levees flooding. So, you know, every single hospital in New Orleans, uh, in the parish of, New or of Orleans Parish, suffered tremendous damage and um, ultimately had to be closed or evacuated. But, you know, these evacuations occurred after the storm as opposed to even being able to think about doing it in advance. So it's a pretty harrowing experience and something up to that point in my career, my life, I had never experienced. Yeah, something tells me that's not in the uh, hospital management handbook. You know, well, go to page 13 <laughs> if a Category 5 is uh, going to ravage your city. And all the directions are right there. It tells you what to do, I'm sure. <laughs> a lot of it is just yeah. in, in instinct and, and common sense and, and using what's around you. And one thing that I was uh, noticing, less uh, during the evacuation of Houston, uh, just these heartbreaking images of uh, very good volunteers, good medical professional people evacuating children from a children's hospital and flying them all to Dallas or somewhere where they would be safe just simply because of uh, there, there's such a reliance on, on, on life-sustaining equipment that they were afraid just simply would not be able to be maintained in the in this thick of this storm here. Did you have things yeah. like that involving some patients at the hospital that you were overseeing that, look, these these are critical people that we've got to get them somewhere where they're, we know they're going to be safe because they need equipment to stay alive every day? Yes, uh, absolutely. In fact, the, the very first patients, that were evacuated from Turo um, were the babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. And 
uh, 13, literally 13 neonatal intensive care babies uh, that were in the um, what we call a NICU, NICU, were the first to be evacuated. And we evacuated them to facilities in um, another part of Louisiana, and then many of, the, of them, I think at least half of them, were evacuated again to Houston at the time because Houston was a receiving center for us. And uh, now that the tables were turned, you know, this time around. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very um, sobering experience, especially if you think about it. And I am not being critical in any way when I say that of those 13 babies, none of the parents were with us. So they entrusted their babies and the lives of those babies to us. All of them were safely evacuated. And, um, but the babies were separated from their parents. And then we had to go through the task and all of the, the craziness that occurred with uh, Katrina because that, that storm was unprecedented at the time in terms of uh, the devastation over such a wide area. I mean, an area the size of Great Britain was was flooded. Uh, you know, as far as I could see, everything was flooded. But, you know, to think of, of children, you know, little babies being evacuated and being separated from their parents and then, you know, having to, to reunite them later on. So we went through that. We actually evacuated close to 240 patients and had a complete evacuation of the hospital uh, within four days. Actually, Toro Infirmary was the first hospital to be evacuated, and it was the very first hospital to reopen because there was no other hospital in Orleans Parish that was able to be brought back online uh, because all of their plants, their power plants, had been flooded. Fortunately, where Turo is, it's on the high side of the bowl. You know, New Orleans is like a bowl, so mm-hmm. the, the hospital is actually a, a few feet above sea level, so we didn't suffer the devastation that occurred when the levees broke. So uh, our plant didn't go underwater. Turo was actually the first one to reopen and was the only adult with two care hospital operating in New Orleans for five and a half months Wow! Uh, after the storm. So everything really fell on us. And, you know, what was difficult was, uh, you know, putting uh, a staffing plan back together. Many people couldn't make it back. Then people that were coming back, you know, we were able to hire many people that were from, all of the other hospitals that were looking to come back, uh, you know, to New Orleans and, and try to rebuild their lives. So um, it, it was just a very unique, not just career experience, but life experience as well. Yeah, pretty remarkable. Fortunately, you know, good outcome. Yeah, pretty remarkable undertaking, I'm sure. Um, with this uh, evacuation here and, and whatnot, I'm sure plans leading up to this was the mindset at the time less so as, okay, we have some facts, we have some statistics, what we can expect with wind and rain and whatnot. Let's pretend it's going to be five or ten times worse and take those steps because it's better to be overprepared and, and everybody's fine than just sort of like take this kind of nonchalantly and face a real, real disaster. I'm sure it was you and a team of, of, of planning people and management and whatnot from the hospital uh, who sort of formulated some sort of plan. Did you sort of take a worst-case scenario approach to this in, in preparing? No, actually, Bert, the storm came up on us so quickly Um that you know, the hospital in New Orleans, uh, Toro and others, they had experience with hurricanes. So their culture would be hunker down, you know, get through it, and then you know, come out, you know, when the sun comes out the next day. And and that would have been the case in Katrina's situation, even with with all the damage that was done from the storm. But what really created an aberrant situation was the fact that the levee, levees broke, and it just created a a disaster of untold proportions. So. In terms of preparation, you know, the hospital had a, a disaster plan, and we implemented that. And you know, essential personnel, and you know, all of the all of the precautions that you take. But you know, really, there was very little time to prepare. You know, your comment before about about instincts, and you know, as a leader, I mean, you know, you lead a team. So fortunately, there was a team that had had experience with this. And for some of the decisions I had to make, um, you know, I was uh, very well supported and we did it as a team. But I don't think that even when Katrina was coming based on past practice, I don't past experience. I don't believe anybody had even thought about that we would end up evacuating the hospital because no one expected, you know, really, um, you, you know, the result of uh, of the aftermath of Katrina. That, and, and it was really the levees breaking that did it, because if you look at Mississippi, they actually had far more damage from the storm 
in terms of buildings literally, you know, and houses and homes literally being washed away as opposed to the impact of the flooding, which caused a, a huge level of devastation. But it, it was different than um, than a direct hit, which um, which happened in Mississippi. So that was the unprecedented nature of that. And the fact is, after the, after in the aftermath, the, the the city, the state, and the federal government, you know, was having trouble getting their act together, and a lot of people suffered in the meantime. Yeah. And not only suffered, but also died because of the. The, the delay in the response, you know, uh, over 1,800 people lost their lives in, in Katrina as a result of Katrina. You had mentioned uh, so, about uh, having a disaster plan in place. Uh, fast forwarding to today, Les, uh, I'm sure your hospital and maybe all the hospital systems in our state, are they required by law to have some sort of disaster plan ready to go, be it a hurricane, earthquake, tornado, fire, insert disaster here? Uh, there are things that are in place now, uh, I'm sure, in your oh, hospital, absolutely. but uh, across the state and maybe across the country? Well, absolutely, across the country. I mean, we, we just through you know regulations, state regulations, state guidelines, and then the accrediting agencies, you know, be it you know uh, the federal government or what's called the Joint Commission, which is the primary accrediting agency for hospitals. We are required to have uh, you know certain procedures in place, plans uh, you know for life safety, environment of care. It's referred to. So absolutely, I mean, it's a very simple thing. You know, we're constantly, we're constantly uh, testing our generators. So there is a regular periodic test of the emergency generators because the one thing that was common in all three hurricanes that I've had experience with, because when I came back to New Jersey in 2008, which is my home state, then not long after we had um, we had Irene, and then we also had Superstorm Sandy. So. You know, I'm not an expert in disaster planning. I just am someone that had experience with three of them, and, and Katrina being the worst of them. So you you are always, always in, you have to have a culture of preparedness, and you know certain plans in place and drill. And then there are instances, you know, where it's the real thing. Like for instance, in New Jersey, uh, we have had the experience, and some hospitals did evacuate uh, as a result of Sandy, and we've had this you know experience with Irene. So you know the the best. The best practice is when it's for real as opposed to a drill. But the answer to your question is yes, we do all of that and take, uh, you know, as much preparation and have as much preparedness as we can. And I think the state and the federal government learned its lesson with Katrina because everybody got caught flat footed. Yeah, and then sounds you have like state it. government, uh, you know, state, city and federal uh, state and uh, city and federal government at odds trying to figure out who's in charge. And in the meantime, you know, the, the disaster, you know, became uh, uh, a worse disaster just yeah. because of that. But I think a lot's been learned over the years. I agree. And I, I think just in the recovery for New Orleans and what we're seeing now in Houston and Florida and as the, the current storms that, of course, we're wrestling with, getting that hospital, getting that medical facility, that first one back open is really a big step forward. It gives people to go, whether it's uh, you're creating just sort of a, a, a triage area or somewhere where, where people can go just to seek medical attention or just shelter or whatever. And and for the people that were putting their own lives on hold less, and I'm sure you did it too, uh, your own recovery and your own rebuilding and, and telling your own family mm-hmm. that, hey, you know what, I've got a, I've got a job I got to do here first to take care of other people. I, I'm sure you had staffers who were uh, sleeping in corners of the hospital because they you know couldn't get home or they would just you know grab a, a, a cold shower or uh, the warmest cup of coffee they could possibly find and and just put in hour after hour after hour at the pos- at the hospital just because there was such a demand going on I'm sure you saw that in the in the aftermath oh absolutely you know uh, during and and certainly after um, you know and, and many of the people that I worked with um, in, in New Orleans, I, I can remember even in the first 30 hours of the storm, you know, some of the fear that was setting in and people worrying about their own homes. And, and there were people, you know, that were working the storm uh, as leaders and, you know, support staff uh, that actually lost their homes, that got flooded by uh, when the levees broke. And they lost their homes. They lost everything that they had and had to completely rebuild. So not only not only during Katrina were they, taking care of other people and, and their well-being, but they had on their minds what was going on in, in their own personal life as far as the prospect of losing their home, and, and that actually happened. Many of them lost their homes and just uh, had terrible stories. And, you know, the other thing I would point out mm-hmm. 
you know, we're watching what's going on with Harvey and the terrible devastation and what happened with Irma. You know, Jose looks like it's off the coast and it's not going to be so bad. Now Maria's coming up and the damage that's, you know, whether it will hit the United States or not will remain to be seen. But, but the point I would make is that, you know, the, 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 the coverage, and I'm not being critical of the news because, you know, news is fluid on a day-to-day basis based on what's going on in, in the world. And the fact is the rebuilding efforts are going to take years. When I was down in New Orleans for three years I was there, there wasn't a day that went by that Katrina wasn't a part of my life. So the point is, you know, the rest of the world moves on yeah. because it's not their issue on a day-to-day basis. And then these these folks that have been affected will be living with this uh, for quite a while, you know, uh, in terms of the rebuilding and the aftermath. And, you know, uh, I, I remember the, the term, you know, we, we use the term, you know, Katrina fatigue. Mm. You know, the rest of the country, you know, was tired of hearing about Katrina. Should we rebuild New Orleans, not rebuild New Orleans? And all of that dialogue and debate and then the funding that's required and the bureaucracy, you know, to work through that. But the fact is, um, for the folks that have been affected here so badly, whether it's in the Caribbean or, you know, certainly in the United States that got hit badly by Irma and Harvey, they'll be living with this uh, for for the next few years to come. It won't go away so quickly. Yeah, you're but, right. Um, and that's the thing we can't forget is that it's not over, maybe over in the news in all due respect, not that I'm being critical of the news, it, but it won't be over in their lives and in those areas where they're rebuilding. Gotcha. An incredible firsthand account. Uh, Les Hirsch, interim CEO, president of St. Peter's Healthcare System. Thank you for sharing your experiences this morning. And uh, as we learn things as we go along, uh, and I think we, there was a lot of learning that was happening with all these storms that are going on. And uh, to learn and to be prepared uh, will be better for all of us going forward. So, Les, thank you again for the time. All right. Uh, Bert, it's my pleasure, and uh, thanks for having me. Of course, anytime. All right, Jersey Central traffic and weather time. We're already at 825. Traffic and weather every 10 minutes on the fives and the traffic. Tom Colangelo.